Hi there, my name is Kevin Alcuni, and I'm a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department with the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Main, Something in Common, a virtual tour. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Main programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapo.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapo.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. We'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. And now onto today's program, Something in Common, a virtual tour. Enjoy this guided overview of the library's latest exhibition, Something in Common. Todd LaRue, the curator of the exhibition, will give a virtual guided tour, as well as provide background information on the exhibit and the stories it contains. Exploring unique connections, something in common is an examination and celebration of the ideas, interests, and beliefs that bring people together. Through the stories of fascinating and sometimes surprising social clubs and organizations, this, exhi this exhibition will highlight the importance of finding common ground and points of connection. Uh, I'd also like to mention at this point that we will be showing a video that will be highlighting a lot of these things. Um, and we are unmasked in the video, but it is still city policy to keep your mask on while visiting uh, the library and the exhibitions. I just wanted to uh, let people know about that. Todd LaRue is the director of special projects for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, producing exhibitions and public programs in partnership with the Los Angeles Public Library. He is the author of Specific Museums of Greater Los Angeles, was the producer of the At Museum A Day campaign on Instagram, and is currently working on a new book that will feature dozens of unique small museums across the Los Angeles area. And it is, and it is expected in 2024 from Angel City Press. He holds an MFA in experimental sound composition from the, from the California Institute of the Arts and was the winner of the 2014 American Composers Forum National Composition Contest. I had to practice that. Uh, now let's welcome Todd LaRue onto our LA Made stage. Hey, Kevin, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Yeah. Glad to be joining you today and happy to have this opportunity to share this special exhibition. Yeah, so we have a video prepared. Uh, is there any, uh, anything you wanna share before we start the video? Sure, yeah, just by way of a, a brief kind of introduction to the, the theme and the, what this project is all about. You know, it, we started working on this before the pandemic and um, I've been with the Library Foundation for seven years now and we've had the opportunity to do some really wonderful programs in the past that highlight a specific collection or resource here at the public library. But this time we wanted to look at something a little more intangible. That's definitely part of the library's DNA, uh, but that we don't think about or talk about quite as literally or as often, I guess. And that's the library as a community building space. Uh, you know, we've got 73 locations just in the city of Los Angeles and the LAPL system. And there's so many examples of people who are connected to others in the community through the library that they might not otherwise meet. And so that's kind of the aspect of the library that we wanted to honor in this project, but also cast a much wider net and see what are the other unique types of community groups out there and what are the interesting things and stories that are bringing people together across Los Angeles and beyond. So I, I mentioned we started before the pandemic. When that hit, of course, the you know everything got thrown off, but what it also did was throw this theme into you know front page mm. news practically, the, you know, thinking about isolation and the Surgeon General's topic, talking about the epidemic of loneliness. And I think now in, in this kind of hybrid moment that we're in, we're still thinking about and trying to figure out how do we come back together, what that looks like. And so we're hoping that it's a good time for this conversation. And that all sounds very serious, but there's some really fun and interesting clubs and groups and um, collection items that we have on display and the different stories for the show. So I think we can jump right into the tour and uh, hope you'll join us afterwards for Q&A as well. And thanks again. All right, cool. Roll it, Steve. 
Hi, we're here at the Something in Common exhibition in the Getty Gallery at the LA Central Library uh, on the second floor off the rotunda. And we're excited to give a little tour, a walkthrough of this special exhibition and talk about some of the themes and the, the background and the work that went into it and uh, really dive into some of the stories that we've got on display. And we can start right here with the Los Angeles Community Cookbook Archive. All right. This is the Los Angeles Community Cookbook Archive, and it, it started by an artist named Suzanne Josco. It's really a unique project that she's uh, been working on for the last couple of years, and we're really glad to have the public debut of it here in this Something in Common exhibition. Suzanne is an artist who's been really interested in mapping places in LA across time, not just space. And one of the interesting ways that she's found to do that kind of organically is through these community cookbooks. So each cookbook really represents a different club or community group or church group or civic organization. And she's got hundreds of these now. We have about 100 on display here. Uh, they're all from communities in Los Angeles County going back from the 1890s to the present. And each one kind of has a snapshot of a different specific community-based organization uh, in Los Angeles. And for many of these, it's, it's potentially the only record that that community ever existed if they're not still around. And so you get these little snapshots of, you know, LA history at the community level. And when you put those all together, it paints a really unique and, and kind of important way of looking at the history of our city writ large. And there's some really fascinating, unique groups represented here. You know, there's lots of church groups and synagogues and Buddhist organizations, but then you also have things like uh, the Cactus and Succulent Society cookbook or a square dancer cookbook, an Estonian club, an <laughs> Armenian club. Uh, and so it really does, you know, run the gamut of the different types of communities that are active in Los Angeles, you know. We know this city uh, kind of for having so many different pockets and worlds um, that interact in some ways, but can be very, uh, insular is not the right word, but you know, confined to their specific sure. community little as little well. Bubble, yeah, there's lots of little bubbles. Yeah. Um, and you know, when you put them side by side like this, I think it's just a really fascinating look. And Suzanne is also really interested in bringing these back to life. So she's scanned them all, they're on her project website. You know, she's been cooking from them and ha has been having a lot of fun really bringing the memories of these communities back to life through food and hopes that other people will use the collection to uh, create their own new gatherings around these recipes and ideas as well. Wow, crazy. Do you want to show some of the ones that you've uh, enjoyed when you were re researching this? Yeah, you know, it, it's hard to know where to start, but the, the oldest book in her collection right here is called How We Cook in Los Angeles. And it's from the 1890s. It's from a women's church group. Wow. And that's, you know, among the earliest uh, published books in LA were cookbooks. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think actually the first published book in Los Angeles was a cookbook from a women's church group. Um, next to that, we have the Landmarks Club, which is another early example from her collection. The Landmarks Club was uh, kind of spearheaded by Charles Lummis, who was the one-time city librarian oh. of Los Angeles, an eccentric character from LA history. And that club specifically was on a mission to restore the old missions. And then there's some more you know, recent uh, wonderful examples, The Gay of Cooking uh, by the Kitchen Fairy. Uh, there's some more traditional groups as well, like the Assistance League, the Red Cross, uh, the YMCA, uh, and, and some, you know, like I mentioned, that you maybe wouldn't even think about and that we wouldn't maybe know existed without this. Yeah. We do have community cookbooks here in the library's collections, but they aren't organized in a way that you can find Oh. ones that are specific to community groups. Um, of course, we have a massive and very famous cookbook and cookery collection here at the library, but this is a unique kind of lens or angle looking at uh, what it is that we can learn from them. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Yeah, should we check out the Los Angeles Breakfast Club? Sure, let's do that. All right. Where are we? <laughs> We're in the Friendship Auditorium. Well, not exactly, but that's the home of the Los Angeles Breakfast Club, right. a club that started way back in 1925, so almost 100 years old now. Uh, and at that time, there were some businessmen, some studio heads that would go horseback riding through Griffith Park before work, and they would tell <laughs> stories, and it became a thing. Right. And then they ha would have guest speakers, and they decided, let's start a club. And by the 1930s, this club became so prominent that, you know, everyone who's anyone in Los Angeles had to be a member. It was broadcast, their weekly meetings were broadcast live on Warner Brothers Radio to a nationwide audience. Um, lots of very famous people have been initiated over the years. 
And you know, one of the what, what's most interesting, I think, and in, in I did a lot of research about the kind of arc of community groups and participation, and a lot of sociologists have been saying for decades that there's this decline mm. in participation in all kinds of community groups. Right. And the Breakfast Club is like most other groups that you can think of, had really struggled to attract uh, new members, a, a younger crowd right. in recent decades. Um, but miraculously, they were able to do that. They had a kind of revival within the last decade. Uh, and it's a, now it's unique because it's extremely diverse in age. There's people, members who are uh, from their 20s up to their 90s, and they're all kind of uh, friends. You know, That's really the theme of the Breakfast Club, is friendship and hospitality. They actually call uh, the building where they meet is, is officially named Friendship Auditorium, and they also call it the, fr the Shrine of Friendship. Oh. Uh, so this is, this is a big, uh, th that kind of camaraderie, uh, that sense of welcome that you get is really baked into their DNA in a very intentional way. But there's also uh, a really whimsical aspect and a lot of humor incorporated in some of their traditions and rituals. Uh, we're standing right in front of their cryptogram, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, a mysterious message that they recite in unison each Wednesday. Uh -huh. uh, and so they, they wheel this out on stage. This is actually the original from 1936. Wow. Uh, and we painted uh, a replica because they continue to use it weekly. They still need to have it. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so they bring it out on stage every week and they recite it all in unison. They say FVNEM, SVFM, FVNEX, SVFX. Oh, I see, VFMNX. And so it's kind of a, a code. I don't know if you have any thoughts about what that might mean. If you think about what it sounds like. Uh, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky one. It's, it was created by a cartoonist uh. in the 30s who had a, a comic strip called Barney Google, who apparently spoke in this kind of cryptic language using just letters that sound like things. So hey. in the case of The Breakfast Club, it, it stands for, have we any ham? Yes, we have ham. Have we any eggs? Yes, we have eggs. Oh, I see. We have ham and eggs. Yeah, I wouldn't have figured that. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> tricky, but now that you know, you can't unhear it. So, all right, I'm gonna practice. Yeah, yeah. So when you go attend, you'll be ready to, to sure. shout it out loud with them. <laughs> yeah. They still meet every Wednesday uh, over at Friendship Auditorium. They have their singing, their secret handshake. Uh, the initiation, which is a really important part of any good club. And so for that, they, they, we can go right over here to Ham. Uh, all right, you're going to tell me about Ham? Yeah, this is Ham, the, the ritual initiation sawhorse. Oh. Uh, and this goes back to the early days. You know, there's pictures of Walt Disney and other notables from the day sitting on ham because that's what you do when you're being initiated. You, you sit on the horse, you're blindfolded, no. you put your hand in a plate of cooked runny eggs, and then you repeat whatever the president of the club kind of wants you to say. It's kind of tailored to each person. Gotcha. Uh, but that's, that's the, it, you know, it's all in good fun. And it's amazing to see some of these old pictures of people like Ronald Reagan and others being initiated with their hand in a plate of eggs, blindfolded. And uh, just last year, a couple months ago, actually, our current congressman, Adam Schiff, oh. uh, was a, a special guest, and he went through the initiation as well. So that was really fun to see. Good sport. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So let's uh, explore some of the other stories that we've got on display here. We'll move on to the 29 Palms Historical Society and their annual weed show. Okay, sounds good. Okay, this is a pretty unique, yes, we've got the big banner announcing the <laughs> weed show, and it's not that kind of weed. It goes back to the 1930s, actually, when a uh, really notable artist at that time, Mildred Bryant Brooks, and we have a couple of her pieces from our library special collections on display here. Uh, she was based in Pasadena, and she went to give a, a presentation on her work to the Women's Club in 29 Palms, up in the high desert, east of Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. And when she got there, the women that were hosting were kind of embarrassed that they didn't have fresh flowers available to decorate the, the podium to, oh. uh, to honor their guest. And she said, why do you need flowers when you have such beautiful weeds out here? Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they loved that, so they decided, let's, let's go get some dried plants outside, some weeds, and, and make a kind of... Uh, bouquet or display out of that. And so th starting the next year, they decided, let's, you know, we really want to celebrate our native environment and our community. So rather than a more traditional flower show, let's have a, a weed show. And uh, people bring these dioramas that they make according to different themes uh, that all incorporate dried desert flora and other found objects. 
<laughs> and the event continues to this day. It's, in, I think, in its 80th year this November. Wow. It's a, and it's a really wonderful community event because it brings out so many different types of people from that area, from the national park, from the local marine base, from the artist community, from the homesteaders and other old timers out there. And they all kind of come together to, to celebrate this unique art form that's specific to their local area. So we have here a display of uh, basically a mini weed show, many different types of examples of the mm -hmm. kinds of pieces that you would see in the early days as well as in recent decades. Uh, and it really does kind of just speak to the, the beauty of the area, the, the creativity in the community, and uh, how something so unique as the weed show can really serve to bring people together. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Do you want to tell me more about the... Uh... South El Monte Art Posse? Yeah, you know, the, some of the ones that we've been looking at are very historic, that mm -hmm. go back into the uh, 100 years or more in, in some cases. So now let's take a look at the South El Monte Arts Posse, which is a much more recent community organization. All right, cool. You want to tell me a little bit about uh, what's happening here? Yeah, the South El Monte Arts Posse. This is an interesting group. So, you know, we looked at some of the more historic and more formal types of clubs that have presidents and secretaries. And I kind of already alluded to the fact that some of those more formal organized groups are really struggling to attract uh, younger generations and, and people because it's a big time commitment to take on one of those leadership positions. And, you know, there's so many more distractions and demands on our time in recent years. Uh, so this is a, a model for a different kind of group that actually started within the last decade. Uh, and it's based in El Monte, which is a small city in the San Gabriel Valley in the eastern L.A. County. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a city that in their official history has really only celebrated the, the white pioneers and kind of left out the stories of people of color and minorities right. who've always been a big part of that community. And this was a group of artists and writers and professors uh, and uh, public historians who really thought, you know, we have a great opportunity here to kind of expand that conversation and get the, our broader community thinking about the different types of stories that really represent us as well. Uh, one of the things the group wanted to look at was the official city seal for El Monte. Uh, and we've got an example of the official seal here uh, on the left there of the display. And you see it's got the covered wagon coming over land and it says end of the Santa Fe Trail. Um, well, that, uh, that idea of it being the end of the Santa Fe Trail has been proven incorrect. It's, right. in fact, not true. Um, and the covered wagon imagery is really only celebrating the story of the white pioneers who came by land to settle this area that had already been, uh, you know, settled by generations of right. indigenous and communities from uh, Mexico and uh, other places. Uh, and they were kind of being left out of this official narrative. So they said, why don't we start, or you know, what would it look like to create our own seal for the city that represents everybody? And they put out an open call in the community and got more than 100 responses oh. and commissioned the artist Daniel Gonzalez to kind of bring that all together and create a new city seal, a, a vision for the city um, that really is more inclusive. And you know, it's got na the Tongva names of the local rivers, it's got, uh, the, a singing frog, La Cantarana, that represents one of the uh, original Mexican camps in the area, uh, a Vietnamese lion, um, and some of the native uh, plants and uh, people really showing the, the beautiful diversity of the yeah. city. Cool. And they've done a lot of public art projects and tours of the city that really seek to highlight some of those stories of communities that aren't otherwise getting shared. Oh. All right. Uh, there's another activity that they did here uh, that they're calling Collective Shade, uh -huh. where they took a poem about the history of El Monte to our pioneers. It's very romantic. Yeah. And they took that poem to their bike tours and other events throughout the city that they were doing, and they overlaid a transparency sheet on top of that and invited people to respond to this poem, react to it, uh, critique and edit it. Right. And there's some really wonderfully creative responses um, that it kind of interfere and throw shade, as they say, oh, and, gotcha. and kind of correct the things that they see as being out of touch or insensitive in the original poem. Wow. Uh, it's a really kind of beautiful way to pick apart that narrative and uh, insert more creative voices into it. What should we look at next? Uh, next, let's go take a look at another really fascinating community and group. It's called the Baseball Reliquary. Okay, cool. 
I hate to admit that I'm personally not a huge baseball fan, but I really love the baseball reliquary because they're, they're more about sharing the stories and the, the unique history and looking at American society through the lens of baseball history and the characters who have, you know, really done some important things. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've commissioned art, they have collected art. It, it is a club, people who are members vote to install people in what they call the Shrine of the Eternals. Oh. It's, a, it's an initiation uh, kind of Hall of Fame. People often refer to it as the People's Hall of Fame because they're more interested in stories than statistics. And one of the people that was honored was Ted Giannoulis, who's the creator of the San Diego Chicken, the costume that we're, is right behind us here, uh, kind of overseeing the production today. Hi. Uh, so this character that Ted Gino has created is kind of credited for popularizing mascots in professional sports and was for decades a very beloved figure in San Diego and nationwide as well. And when he was inducted into the Shrine of the Eternals, he donated this game-worn costume to the baseball reliquary, and it's been in their permanent collection ever since, which now resides at Whittier College. Mm. Um, the, the group was founded by Terry Cannon, who was a librarian in Pasadena, and a really fascinating, amazing guy who sadly died in 2020. Um, and uh, the, the community's now finding ways to kind of live on. So the collection has all been transferred to Whittier where they have the Society for Baseball Research and uh, they're starting up their events again. And uh, it's, it's really great to see this continuing because it's such a quirky kind of unique uh, thing, the kinds of stories they like to highlight, but it's really resonated with a lot of people. Well, cool. Should we... Uh... We can look at a couple other specific objects here. Yeah. Right here's a, a piece that called The House That Rube Built by the artist Greg Jazuski. And he created this in 2020. It was commissioned by the Baseball Reliquary to celebrate the centennial of the Negro Leagues of baseball. Um, so the house that Rube built, that's Rube Foster. He was the founder of the Negro Leagues, uh, which started uh, in 1920 at the YMCA in Kansas City. And actually the, the wings of this piece fold shut and then the little block that slides to close it is a replica of the cornerstone of that YMCA where they had their first meeting. Oh. And uh, the piece is really packed with details. It's got these, uh, they call it lenticular uh, pictures where you know it's at an angle so if you look from different angles you see a different picture that lines up so that's Rube Foster again on the left and Jackie Robinson on the right who played in the Negro Leagues before breaking the color barrier uh, in the national major leagues um, it's got the some of the other key star players from the leagues some of the celebrity owners of teams like Louis Armstrong and Cab Calloway um, but it's just a really imaginative and beautifully detailed tribute to this history yeah yeah it's beautiful what should uh what should we look at next okay let's go from something a little more rooted and, and down to earth in a way mm -hmm. and uh onto something a little more ethereal and that's the Cloud Appreciation Society all right cool Okay, here we are with the Cloud Appreciation Society. This is actually the only international group that we're featuring in the Something in Common exhibition. They have members all over the world in almost every country, tens of thousands of members, people who share an interest and love and appreciation for clouds, for this <laughs> natural beauty that we all have access to. Sure. And one of the things that I really like, you know, thinking about our themes for this exhibit and um, the power of collective action in a way, uh, we have here an example of something that they were able to accomplish collectively that couldn't have been done otherwise. And so the big projection against the back wall here is an example of a cloud that um, they, so the club is collecting pictures and videos of amazing cloud formations all over the world mm -hmm. every day. And they basically collected enough evidence of this particular formation, which has the kind of dramatic wavy underside, uh, to, to really document and prove that this was a type of cloud that hadn't been officially named. Oh. And they were successful in petitioning the World Meteorological Organization to declare this asparatus as the first new cloud type since the 1950s. Oh, wow. uh, and you know, that couldn't have been done by any uh, professional meteorologist working from a single place. Right. Uh, you really needed a global network of people who share this interest. Another fun thing we have for the Cloud Appreciation Society is a display of the cloud of the day on the, the small monitor here mm -hmm. is actually updating every day because if you're a member of this group, you get an email every morning of a, a cloud of the day uh, that shows a picture or a painting of a cloud along with a description or a poem or a just scientific uh, you know, 
overview of what's going on with the optical uh, ephemer uh, optical phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, every day this updates with the cloud that was sent out to members that very morning. Wow, cloud of the day. It is, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, way to start your day. Um, let's uh, keep moving, I think. Yeah. Uh, another uh, more recent group and a, a wonderful community called the Feminist Center for Creative Work. Okay, let's check it out. All right, yeah. What's going on? This is the Feminist Center for Creative Work, formerly the Women's Center for Creative Work. Uh, it started with a group of friends that got together for a dinner where they really wanted to intentionally discuss the state of contemporary feminism. And it became clear that there was a real hunger for this kind of conversation and a big community that wanted to, to kind of dedicate themselves to amplifying this kind of conversation, this work. So they created a space in Frogtown along the LA River where they had all kinds of events from, you know, how to fix your car and how to build a synthesizer and printing workshops and uh, workshops relating to motherhood and um, a lot of social, social justice activations and activities. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful group. Um, so they were actually getting ready to sign the lease on a larger space when the pandemic hit. And they were forced to kind of back down instead and regroup. So they're in a smaller uh, kind of office space and uh, they're still publishing and hosting events and uh, partnering with other institutions to do exhibitions off site. Um, but it's still a really active and lively community. So we commissioned them to create portraits of some of their members, which was done by Salima Allen, one of their members. Uh, who created portraits of 15 of the other members of this group. Uh -huh. And they also sent along these statements about what it means to them. Oh. Uh, and it's, it's really powerful reading, you know, in their own words, what it's meant to have this space, uh, kind of safe space for these ideas and, uh, you know, people for a place for them to feel seen and connected. Oh, that's great. Wow. All right. Or should we go to... Uh, next, I want to take a look at the banners that we commissioned, and this is really our opportunity to highlight the, our public libraries themselves as community gathering places, and okay. it's kind of the centerpiece of the exhibition, okay. so let's yeah. check it out. Cool. All right, yeah, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, what's happening here? So these banners were created specially for this exhibition. We commissioned the artist Christine Wong Yap who's based in the Bay Area, but who's done a, a number of projects in the past exploring the idea of belonging mm -hmm. and what that looks like and where people find community and, and get their sense of belonging. Uh -huh. And we invited her to spend a week traveling across the city, uh, meeting librarians at a bunch of our different branches across LAPL and uh, talking to them about some of the regular programs that they facilitate or host, mm -hmm. and then talking to some of the patrons that participate in these programs and learning you know, about the sense of connection and belonging that they get from being a part of these groups. Uh, everything from the Watts Willowbrook Conservatory, which is a free string music program in, at the Watts branch, oh. uh, to the teen councils, which are you know, across the system, to the Health Matters Book Club, which is based at the Pacoima Branch Library, or the French Conversation Club at Westwood. Mm -hmm. And so every different community has, a, you know, again, a different thing that's bringing people together, but it's really creating these amazing opportunities for people to find their place in a, in a very big city in the context of the safe space of the public library. Right. And these banners are also uh, part of an international initiative uh, sponsored by Welcome, which is based in London. And they have a project called Mindscapes going on right now, which is all about uh, finding cultural ways to showcase and activate and talk about mental health issues. Oh. Uh, so with support from them as part of their international project, they kind of helped uh, make this commission, this installation possible. Oh, cool. So the front of the bit, each banner has the name of the group and a kind of representative graphic. And then on the back side, there's a quote uh, from one of the participants that really speaks to how, uh, again, that sense of belonging or what it means to them to be a part of that. Also, uh, we have a, a zine here that's free for anyone who visits the exhibition. It's also available to download on the project website. Yeah. Uh, and it really goes more in depth into the artist Christine's process of uh, experiencing these communities and the conversations that she had with patrons and librarians. It's got some activity sheets as well and, and really goes more in depth into that idea of belonging, specifically in the context of our public libraries. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, what should we, uh, what do you want to show me next? Uh, yeah, we'll go into the side gallery here into another really fascinating and specific uh, set of groups that are organized around ro uh, roller pigeons, and I'll explain what that means when okay. we get over there. Sounds good. Yeah. 
<laughs> what is this? Yes. <laughs> Birmingham Roller Pigeons is a unique breed of pigeon that's known for rolling, which basically means that mid-flight they do these tumbling backflips. Oh. And they, nobody knows why they do it, but they're, it's kind of genetic, and they're bred for this purpose oh. and raised uh, as a kind of hobby. And it came over from England, but it's L.A. has really become one of the global hotspots of this hobby. And specifically, it's really popular in uh, lower income communities, South L.A., in the high desert, and almost exclusively black and brown men who are participating in this. And they've formed dozens of clubs, oh. roller clubs, that are dedicated to breeding and flying these birds competitively. And there's a whole point system for how they get judged. But what's really amazing is how they talk about, you know, how important it's been to them that uh, caring for these birds has given them a sense of purpose and uh, connection as well. You know, some of these clubs have guys that had been in opposing gangs formerly. So it's really a life changing thing, as, as strange as it might seem. But uh, when you see the birds in action, it's, it's oddly beautiful as well. Wow. And then what are the t-shirts? Yeah, so each club makes a shirt that kind of represents their group when they have a fly day they're, you know, representing. Right. And so they have these fantastic designs, the uh, Secret Society Roller Club, We Got Roll, or the South Central Rollers, 100% Bird Brains. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a really fabulous way of, uh, again, kind of representing this really unique hobby and the communities that form around that. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, let's take a look at a... a, a Another fascinating group with a lot of history in LA, the Los Angeles and or Southern California Microscopical Society. <laughs> Look forward to looking into it. Yes, indeed. So the Microscopical Society of Southern California is the oldest group of its kind in the country. And they have members who are interested in all things microscopic from art, science, and history. And we have those three big buckets represented in the display here. So there's the historical display of a number of vintage and historic microscopes and other optical equipment that's mm -hmm. related on loan from one of their members who's a retired uh, professor of biology at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, for the science piece, we've got some microscopes on the table that visitors can actually look into. They're on and they're displaying slides that are on loan from the Tar Pits Museum yeah. that show some of the more recent science that they've been doing around climate change in the pollens that they can identify from the Tar Pits. Mm -hmm. um, and then the artistic piece, which is the slideshow of images against the back wall and an accompanying soundtrack of music that's on a loop when you come here to the gallery. Uh, and this is a project called Fantasies in Crystal, which was started by Robert Forrester, uh, who was a very active member of the society for decades, who took these beautiful pictures uh, through a microscope of various crystals of chemicals. Oh. Um, and uh, he would perform that as a slideshow with classical music accompaniment. And now he's passed, but his granddaughter, Erin Schneider, and her dad, John Schneider, have taken this up as a multi-generational family project. And they've taken their the slideshow back out and performed live accompaniment to it on a pump organ and a unique type of viola. Uh, so that's, uh, again, kind of showing the artistic side, the scientific, as well as historical side. But they all kind of come together around uh, these kind of miniature worlds and things that are not visible to the naked eye, but that, where you can find so much beauty. Yeah. How, how long has it been around for? Since the 1920s in some form. Wow. Yeah. So, and they, pre-pandemic, they were meeting at the Crossroads School, so they've yet to resume in person. Oh, um, but there's, it's, it's a really unique kind of community and people <laughs> coming from a lot of different backgrounds yeah. and interests, but they have this to share. Yeah. Yeah, pretty unique. So we've got one more group that we want to highlight, and we'll, we'll go check that out now. It's the Los Angeles Black Underwater Explorers. Okay, let's do it. All right. What are we going to dive into here? We're diving into the uh, Black Underwater Explorers of Los Angeles. It's an African-American scuba diving club that started 30 years ago. Uh, and at that time still, and even sometimes today, unfortunately, people of color, when they go scuba diving, uh, would be made to feel unwelcome or even hearing racist remarks like, oh, can you even swim? So they wanted to create an environment where people of color and uh, young folks in particular could, could feel welcomed into the sport and uh, a kind of support network and also uh, an opportunity to, to learn how to, how to scuba dive. So they have free classes for people to learn how to dive 
they go on trips not just locally, they do beach cleanups and you know, camping, diving trips in Malibu and Catalina, but they also travel all over the world to warm water locations, um, tropical locations. Uh, some of their members are also part of an international team that's researching underwater uh, slave shipwrecks oh. and uh, that doing some really important archaeology around those sites. Mm -hmm. So again, there's you know, members coming from uh, different backgrounds and different specific interests, but who share this um, appreciation for the under, you know, we just looked at the microscopic worlds. Right. Now, uh, this is a community who's really invested in exploring the underwater world, yeah. which is a place not many of us get to see. Right. Um, and this was a group, you know, for an exhibition, uh, they didn't have a lot of stuff that would represent them, oh, wow. um, as many of these other groups do, as we've seen. So we really wanted to find a way to document them, to capture their story. Mm -hmm. So we staged a, a photo shoot on the beach, and they got together their whole group uh, to take this beautiful portrait, as well as some of the interviews on the, the screen we have here, to, to share a little more in depth about what it's meant to them to be part of this group, how it got started, and what yeah. it's all about. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, so that kind of wraps up our tour of the Something in Common exhibition. I know it's kind of a eclectic mix, but we really wanted to cast a wide net and get a, a range of different types of things and show what are some of the more unique stories that are connecting people. And, and you know, ideally get visitors to think about uh, what is it that connects me with others, or where do I find my people? And I think especially now in this time of sort of COVID, post-COVID that we're experiencing and, and thinking about how do we come back out and come back together and what does that look like? Uh, I think it's really important to, to think about that. And, uh, you know, it's so important to have community in your life. And for many who are able to find it at the library, that's an amazing thing that we're able to provide. So the opportunity to highlight that aspect is really important to this. Um, but more, we just want people to, uh, you know, engage and explore and kind of learn about their city and the communities that surround them and find ways that they might connect as well. And how long is the exhibit going to be going on? It's up until November 6th, okay. and we're open seven days a week, so come on down and check it out. All right, appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, Kevin. All right. That was everything, huh? <laughs> we fit it all in, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How did you feel after, like, after all the work that you put in into the exhibit and the first time you were able to kind of show it to the public? I mean, how? Because you you started pre-COVID. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, uh, obviously there was a, a hiatus during the time when we didn't know when the library was reopening or what was going on in the world. Um, but uh, I had a really great team that I worked with on the concept and the design. And uh, we kind of kept in touch throughout. And uh, our conversation certainly evolved around what was going on, but we kept the, our eyes on the, the same goal. And it was so gratifying to finally be able to share that and you know invite people back into the library and see their reactions. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. About how long do you think from like soup to nuts it took for you to kind of from concept to like the finished product? Yeah, well, let's say if we had not had a pandemic, uh, a project of this kind of scope and scale would probably take minimum two years, I'd say, from the earliest conception and the research phase, right. pulling it all together. Um, this one, of course, took longer with huh. the, I, I think it ended up being about an, a year and a half delay from when it was originally scheduled to open um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's a long process, but it gives you time to really consider, um, how people might engage with the subject and talk to a lot of different folks about how they, uh, think about this theme or what they're engaged with. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's always worth it. Yeah. About how many groups, um, did you kind of meet with before settling in on, uh, the groups that are in there now? Yeah, I was fortunate to do a lot of the background research before the pandemic. So, you know, folks were still meeting in person and I could go out uh, several nights a week to check out different clubs that were meeting in their the places where, wherever they were. Um, and I probably, I think I counted, I jo either joined or visited something like close to a hundred different clubs. That's and crazy. they weren't, they're not all like uh, something you have to go to once a week. Uh, you know, some of them, you're just getting the newsletter from the International Guild of Knot Tires. Um, they do meet regularly, actually, in San Pedro. It's a wonderful group. 
Um, I joined some of the fraternal or secret societies like uh, the Odd Fellows and the Moose and Elks and Eagles to see what those were all about. Um, so it was it was it was really a fun way to kind of explore the city at this community level and see all the different things that people organize themselves around and the the worlds that people occupy. Wow, a hundred. Uh, would you say that a lot of them were kind of provincial and that they were associated with like an area or a neighborhood, or was it more of a topic, or was it kind of a hybrid of both? Yeah, it's. I mean, we. Uh, I, I hope is kind of evident in the ones that we ended up featuring. We definitely wanted to have a diversity of different types of group, uh, newer groups, older groups, um, ones that are specifically focused on local history or culture and some that are uh, much broader or dedicated to some specific hobby or topic or craft. Um, so it's it was really all of the above, you know. Mm. Um, I joined some historical societies around town um, some that are interested in the history of a specific field like circus music is a pretty specific one. Um, so the, you know, it, it's what was interesting. I kind of came to realize is that there's almost anything that you could be interested in or think about. There is a community out there of people that share that interest and it can be really gratifying to connect with them and, and um, build community around whatever that specific thing is. And, and the fact that a lot of those are taking place at our libraries across the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the librarians are hosting dozens of, you, you know, book clubs alone. There's all kinds of unique, more specific, you know, there's graphic novel clubs, there's book clubs in Spanish and Farsi and um, Korean and um, sewing club programs and lots of other different types of community building types of groups within the library. So we wanted to be able to sh be sure to honor that as well. Yeah. How did you find, I mean, a hundred, I don't even, I don't even know where you begin to um, like Google that. Um, yeah. It's, what, it's a really, process? It, it's a piecemeal process, I guess you could say. I mean, some mm -hmm. of these groups I've been aware of or even a member of for longer than this project, like the LA breakfast club mm -hmm. uh, or the baseball reliquary, which I've, you know, been so fascinated and inspired by for a couple of years now. Um, and then, you know, folks that know that I'm working on this project might be members of something and pass that along or hear about something and send a link. Uh, or other than that, you know, just really keeping your eyes peeled as you're moving through the world and internet rabbit holes are, can be a beautiful thing. <laughs> and, uh, well, I mean, I'm sure, you know something about that. Sure, as a librarian, but um, <laughs> I don't even know like what were the Google search terms that you would use to start like. Oh yeah, I don't know. I'm probably on some <laughs> kind of weird government list by now. <laughs> that, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, what were some of the criteria that you kind of used to finalize which um, ones to highlight um, in the exhibit? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, we definitely want to have a diversity of perspectives in terms of what that kind of community might look like. You know, some of them meet regularly in person. Some are uh, like a Cloud Appreciation is a global network of people that mm. mostly aren't going to meet each other, but they have this common interest, um, old and new. We did want it to have a, a kind of largely have a local focus because mm. we're really, you know, an institution that faces the communities of Los Angeles that we serve here. Um, but beyond that, we wanted to make sure that it was, uh, th that there was some, an element of uh, intrigue and surprise that there are things mm. that maybe uh, you'd be curious to know about, but hadn't heard about yet. That's always something that we're interested in, bringing lots of different types of voices and stories. And I, it's, it's interesting to see them all sharing space. And um, as we, uh, you know, I've been lucky to give a good number of tours and it's interesting that you never know what somebody's going to connect with or have a particular interest or relation to. Um, so it's really great to have a, something like this where there are so many different kinds of things so that hopefully everybody can find something that interests them. Right. And it also, um, I guess it's interesting as an individual when you find something so specific that there's a community for, um, did a lot of people, I mean, I know you didn't feature all 100 clubs, but within those clubs, um, was it gratifying to a lot of those members to find a community of people with, with very specific things? Because I would imagine for a lot of people out there, um, they are, you know, lonely and maybe um, 
you know, not, not finding a connection. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is, uh, it's interesting through the course of the research, seeing how this topic is, um, increasingly something that not just social scientists are talking about, but the U S surgeon general, you know, with a book about loneliness and talking about the epidemic of loneliness and the real, uh, concrete health effects that you can have by this lack of community connection in your life. And it was, it was something that I heard, um, over and over again and talking to the people in the groups that we featured, how it's a, uh, it's beyond just something that's interesting and fun. You know, it's a real lifeline and has mm. given meaning to their lives uh, in ways that they maybe don't get elsewhere or like the pigeon or the Birmingham roller pigeon clubs where um, some of the, some of them have guys that had been in opposing gangs and they'll, they've literally said it saved their life and kept them off the streets. So um, yeah, that's not, that's not a trivial thing. No, for sure. I mean, I think maybe 10 or 15 years ago, like bowling alone, I think that was a big, um, that was a big topic back then. And I think that was before the explosion of social media where you kind of- Yeah, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. This that's is kind right. of the landmark sociological study. Uh, he came out with a second edition in 2020 mm. uh, and the trend continued, unfortunately, since the, it was first published and we're We've just confirmed, actually, that we're going to have him out here later in the fall for a program. So oh, stay cool. tuned for information about that. Looking yeah, uh, forward to it. Yeah, maybe for people who aren't familiar with his work or his book, uh, could you speak a little bit to it about like the kind of thesis that it has? Because I think yeah. it is relevant. Right. Bowling Alone, um, and there have been many works that are inspired by it since then. It came out in 2000, and it really, uh, over hundreds of pages, very eloquently and um, through very thorough research tracked the, the fact of the trend that participation in community groups and civic organizations and even just informally hanging out with friends was consistently down since the 1960s. Yeah. And he looks at so many different aspects that it's there's basically no way to refute the argument by the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a, um, it's a depressing kind of outlook for the the sort of state of community life in this country. And I think a lot of people have been looking to him and other all kinds of places to see how can we reverse this trend. So that's, you know, he's tried to say, if you go back further in history, these things are cyclical and you see how, oh. uh, you know, prior to the post-war boom in American community, there was a, a time of great division, uh, as well in this country. And we did come out of that. So it's, it's been done. It's possible. That's one of the, uh, the hopeful angle to the kinds of trends that he's tracking. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I think we all realize that this is a precarious social political time in this country. And there is a lot of division, um, that, uh, is kind of unprecedented, certainly in my lifetime. So it's, yeah. it's, it is an important thing to talk about. And, um, I think it, I've been really inspired just speaking for myself personally to see how libraries can act as that kind of neutral shared space where you can um, be in a room with somebody that not just you wouldn't meet, but maybe that you wouldn't want to meet or, or have a meaningful conversation with. But that kind of proximity um, is, is important, even that. And so I think, you know, obviously I'm biased, but the library, I think, is the one of the most important democratic institutions that we have. And uh, it's largely for this reason of being welcoming and open to everybody. You're not biased. You're just speaking facts. Libraries yeah. are great. Yeah. Right. Come on. If I you're mean... watching this, I, you better agree. I see yeah. You do. <laughs> um, I forgot my question now. <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess kind of moving forward, like, uh, did you have any uh, big revelations about communities in general going through this process? Did, uh, did things reveal themselves? And, or did you learn anything about communities in general um, having to go through so many different specific groups? Was there kind of a through line that came through? Well, it was um, inspiring to see how many there are and that you can kind of connect with people around most anything that you're interested in. But the, the other thing that was a big learning experience for me was the the studies that are coming out now about specific 
health effects of loneliness and isolation. And there's increasingly uh, really strong evidence for direct ties between, you know, rates of depression and heart attacks and high blood pressure and all of these things tied to how connected you are to your community or how well you know your neighbors. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it's eye opening. Um, and I think it's, it's can be empowering to have that knowledge as well. Uh, yeah. What do you, I mean, what do you suggest for the person out there that is feeling disconnected from society and, um, you know, is seeking a way to gain fellowship in some capacity and just um, be around people? Like, is that something that has come up through all the different things, all the different organizations? That yeah. You've... I mean, I, I'd say just to um, try to not be afraid to reach out to people because and think about what it is that interests you that's something you enjoy and uh see what's out there because undoubtedly there are other people like you and you know if uh, and like for sure you're not alone in however you feel yeah um so just trying to to feel um uh empowered enough i guess to to connect with others and then the the dividends of that are far exceed uh, yeah you'd imagine it's uh it's a tricky thing when you're just out there by yourself and all you think is i'm alone and um for people to say that to you you know the words sometimes don't really penetrate um so yeah it's cool come see the exhibit i mean it really does show um how specific groups <laughs> can really um um you know, come around very specific things and just build off of them. Um, I guess final question for me is, uh, what's next? We've got a couple um, things coming up. So I mentioned we have some programming in affiliation with this project that we're working on uh, before it closes in November 6th. So I mentioned Robert Putnam's going to be coming. And we, we've also confirmed that we're hosting uh, the event that I mentioned in the baseball reliquary section, their okay. Shrine of the Eternals. Um, induction ceremony, the People's Hall of Fame. And uh, this year they're honoring um, Rube Foster, the founder of the Negro Leagues, um, mm -hmm. Max Patkin, who is known as the clown prince of baseball, who performed his kind of vaudeville comedy act at thousands of games over almost 50 years. He's featured in the movie Bull Durham. Mm -hmm. And also uh, Bob Costas, the kind of legendary announcer you may have oh. heard in many mm -hmm. Olympic ceremonies amongst other broadcasts. And um, so that'll be in person here at the Taper Auditorium on November 5th, the day before we close. Oh. And uh, we'll be posting a, a page to register to attend that in the coming weeks and invite folks to check that out. Um, unrelated to this project, we're also working on a, a new initiative that's a partnership between the Library Foundation and LA Public Library called Creators in Residence. And uh, we've been working with an inaugural cohort of two creators who have been in residence with the library for the better part of a year. And uh, in October, we're having a showcase for the work that they've done. It's a, a photographer, Quasi Boyd Bolden, who's uh, focused uh, a kind of urban landscape documentary photographer who's focused a lot on his community and the, and the black experience of LA. And River Garza, who's an interdisciplinary visual artist of Tongva and Mexican descent, um, who's created, uh, they've both done incredible work. It's a suite of new photographs and um, painting collage style pieces that highlight what they've learned of in their process of exploring the public library and the branch system over the last few months. So there's a, an exhibit of their work in the mm -hmm. first floor galleries that opens in October. And on the 16th, uh, we'll have them here in person as well for a conversation and uh, some hands-on all ages workshops as well. So people can meet and interact with those uh, wonderful guys and check out their work. Okay, cool. Um, until then, um, I do want to highlight that if you do want to check out the exhibit, um, go to the URL, um, and I think it lists all the different organizations, right? Tom? Yeah, there's links uh, from there to um, all of the groups that we discussed. There's some of the videos uh, that are featured in the exhibition and uh, some additional content as well. There's a, a zine that would, the artist Christine Wong Yap made that's a uh, companion piece to the beautiful banner she created that you can download if you're not able to come pick up a copy here in the exhibition. So there's a, a lot more there if you want to dig deeper. Yeah. And then also the library store is also selling um, some items. 
uh, yes, cloud, selector. cloud selector from the Cloud Appreciation Society. Yeah. Honk if you have something in common. We've got some original merchandise, the yeah. bumper sticker and a tote bag that's really and, and there the it tote. is. Yeah. So I'm you can uh, yeah, check out the library store either in person after you come see the exhibit or online as we left the URL here. And uh yeah, any any final thoughts, Tom, for the No, public? just well, thank you for um providing this platform for sharing this work. And I hope that uh, people found it fascinating and please reach out if you have any questions uh, or wanna discuss further, we're always open to that. And um, again, it's up through November 6th if you wanna come check it out. And uh, that the project website we put up will also have information about the forthcoming program. So oh, yeah. keep an eye, stay tuned there. And if anybody wants to learn more about the Library Foundation and the work that they do, we have a URL right here. Yes, um, for anyone that doesn't know, we're the private nonprofit that provides a lot of support for the LA public library system across the city. Um, and we also do these cult cultural programming partnerships to sort of bring in new folks as well. But uh, if you're interested in supporting the library, please check us out and uh, be in touch. Yeah. And uh, for anybody who can make it out, please come and see the exhibit. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, the cloud thing in the background is, it's really eye-catching. And uh, um, one of the things that we weren't able to highlight, unfortunately, was the music around the microscopes. Um, it's it's haunting and lyrical and, I, I mean, trippy is kind of the word that I, I thought of. Um, so. Uh, we did a short video, but you come and there's all kinds of things to engage with when you come see the exhibit. So I hope uh, people can have a chance. They still time and uh, it's free to see. It doesn't cost anything. So when you come visit beautiful uh, Central Library, it's just on the second floor. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's 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 really wonderful. I, I, I do go down there sometimes when I just need a break and um, just being surrounded by it, I don't know. It's calming. Uh, I, maybe it's just the nerd in me, but um. <laughs> well, any other nerds out there? Maybe yeah, feel the same I, way. Come see yeah, it. come out and see it. It's really cool. Thanks, so, Kevin. yeah, Todd, thanks so much. We really appreciate all the time and effort, and thanks to Keith who also made the video and spent a lot of time editing it. Um, we really appreciated all of his effort in creating that uh, wonderful video in the first place. So, thanks to Keith Kessler as well. Yeah, I appreciate you and the whole LA Made team and all of my wonderful colleagues at LA Public Library uh, who, you know, we wouldn't be here without uh, your incredible work and the important institution that is the library. So thanks to you. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later, Todd. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next LA Made on Thursday, September 15th at 4 p.m. for a deeper dive into the Los Angeles Community Cookbook Archive. So that was one of the um, exhibits that was featured earlier. Um, artist curator and archivist Suzanne Zoe Josco will be discussing her ongoing project, the LA Community Cookbook Archive, comprised of nearly 400 LA-based community cookbooks that spans 140 years their archive is an evolving food-based tapestry of Los Angeles stories. In this virtual presentation, Joska will give an overview of the project as well as open up the conversation to viewers. She invites attendees to come prepared to share their favorite Los Angeles-centric recipes and food memories as well. Also remember to check out our BioBlitz challenge that starts on September 1st. You can sign up now at lapl.org slash BioBlitz. It's right there on the screen. Uh, so, yeah, you can sign up there and get all the information. Um, lastly, until next time, we truly appreciate all of your support. The success of LA Made and literally all of our library programs couldn't happen without the support from viewers like you. So thanks so much. And have a great rest of your day.